industrial hygienist from environmental consultant and affiliates network out of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And basically we do presentations online and we do a lot of training classes together and I wanted to bring this one to the members this evening, give you a little bit of insight as to mold. And what do you need to know as inspectors? Well, let's put it into reality check here as far as understanding what we're doing when we walk into a home. Give me one second here, please. This is a house in West Virginia. This house was buried on a mountain ridge. It was between the top of the mountain and the bottom of the valley. When you pull up into the driveway, you can see it's all surrounded by trees and shrubs and just a lot of greenery. Now, when you walk around to the front, there's not much front yard, maybe 10 feet before you drop over the front cliff. Basically, you walk around to the other side and you can get a better view of exactly how this is resting in the middle of the mountain. Now, when you walk inside this house, it's pretty clean. Looks clean as a whistle, everything about it. We're talking about a half million dollar home here. You can see everything in here as pristine as can be. This is the kitchen looking into the family room on the first floor. Your second floor you're looking about and everything's really clean. You walk through this building. The attic area is really clean. Uh, a little bit of history lesson. You walk into a house, you don't know the age of it. You look at the underside of the roof in an attic area. All of you know and understand or should understand that OSB was something that came about in the late 70s before they changed from plywood. So you know this is something from late 70s going backwards. So instant tale. So a lot of knowledge there on historic homes. If you guys want me to do a presentation on it, I've been pride myself to look at homes all the way back to 1750. Now, this basically gives you a, a really good understanding of area to know more about. Now, let me bring in this little bit of a report so you'll understand a little bit. Now, I hope everybody can get a handle on this report and can see the numbers fairly well. What you're looking at here to understand a mold report and where you're at is what we have here over on the far right-hand side up here at the top where my fingers are, that's a 25,800 spore count. Now, that was what was in the crawl space of this house. Now, when you go from there and you walk up and you do a mold test on the first floor, Right by the return air register, the mold spore count was 77,000. Now, what does that mean in plain English? Well, you're going to have to look at what is the front porch mold spore count. Well, when you look at the front porch mold spore count, now you go down one page to the spreadsheet. So you're basically looking at where you come in and you look at this is the mold spore count after the house was cleaned up. So the front porch spore count was 93 at both times. And the inside mold spore count on the day of the initial test inside that house was 77,000. We're talking about a really sick house. So when you look at this house, just by walking in to do an inspection, why would you ever think there was a mold problem? There was no evidence of it anywhere, but it was in the air. This was a house that was in the family. It had only been sitting vacant for two months, but due to the nature of where it was located, there was a little bit of moisture in the crawl space, but it wasn't enough to understand why this was so high. But point is that you truly need to be aware of understanding what's out there and where you're at. Now, let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about understanding a little bit more okay this presentation you know as you can see i need to pay the acknowledgements to the ecan organization and a lot of this works with epa and we do a lot of training as per the epi guidelines as you go through this process to understand where we're at now moving forward acknowledgements and cleanup and everything everything goes back to the epa and mold remediation schools and things of that nature now that got rid of the housekeeping now why is it a problem today? Since the 70s, home construction has changed. Those foreclosures, they close for long periods. As Mike said, they're pretty much getting to the point where there are not as many around as there was over the past five years. But one thing that you want to remember, you walk into a home, 
and you have a musty smell. Must is penicillin mold. So put that in a context of Granny's basement. You walk down there and it smells musty and it's damp and it's funky. That's a musty odor and typically related to a penicillin type mold or aspergillus. So just be careful. Don't get yourself into a point that you are the breathing that for extended period of time, like it doesn't bother you. I have, a, I have acquired a health condition because of the mold. My left ear rings because I have attained that aspergillus penicillin in my ear. And when I walk into a house and there's mold there, my ear will ring for two days. And it's just the nature of being around it. And I never thought that, you know, the mold spores would collect inside my inner eardrum and build. And they did. So just be honest with yourself and understand, don't get caught in a crawl space that has a mold problem because that's when it happened to me. Now, you've got a lot to deal with the lack of maintenance, sickness, lawsuits, environmental. And, you know, when you look at regions with higher humidity areas, what do we talk about with higher humidities? Mold is kind of like a flower. When you walk into a house that has a high humidity or a crawl space or a basement, what is high humidity? Where does it begin? Well, high humidity is, you know, they talk about 50% as being high, but mold really begins to grow at about 60% relative humidity. But the odor that's present, that odor is present between 48 and 55, and that's where we pick up that odor. So just be mindful of that. And in, you deal with a house that may have been in a flood or you have water problems, okay? Materials left wet for long periods of time. One thing you want to remember is you walk into a house or you walk into a basement or crawl space area and there's a piece of wood laying there that's wet, black, and slimy. Most of the time, that wet, black, slimy mold is going to be stachybotrys mold. Stachybotrys is toxic by inhalation. So be careful not to be around it too long because that's really what it is. And for years, we never paid attention to it. We just picked it up and threw it in a garbage pile. So these are things that you want to remember. Now, why is mold more prevalent? Uh, statistics saying, Bureau Census, 35% of the homes are damaged due to water or moisture in some manner. And as inspectors, we all know this. We see the water damage most of the time, okay? Basements and crawl spaces, always problematic. Okay, you've got sewer septic breakdowns or backups. Okay, water supply leaks, improperly vented fans and appliances. Number one, improperly vented bathroom fans, exhaust fans, and dryer exhaust. They put moisture right into the air and they cause a lot of problems in humidity. And you'll always find that mold growing behind a dryer or up in the attic around an exhaust fan where they didn't vent it to the outside. Housekeeping issues, this is pretty much what we're talking about. You're looking at that washer and dryer, and again, okay, let's talk about that. You're looking at black mold, okay? So is white mold black mold? Is brown mold black mold? What about that off shade that's yellow brownish mold? What do you think? Well, mold changes colors based upon temperature, relative humidity, and the surface that it's growing upon. An analogy would be bread. Bread is a soft product, so typically we see mold that's green, but it's still mold, and that's why the color is different because of the softness of the material or the composition of what it's on. So these are things that you look at. We always walk into bathrooms. We see these bathtubs areas with the mold scones around it. Do you write it up in a report? What do you tell the clients? Do you let them know that there's an issue there? Cover your bases. Attic areas. I'm sure that everyone here has seen attics that look like this. And that is something that is quite pronounced in areas where we live, okay? Another trade you wanna look at is the left photo has plywood on the roof. The right side has OSB on it. So you're looking at houses from two different areas. So keep in mind, Pay attention to the construction practice so you know where you're at. Now, let's talk about what's caused these construction issues over the years. Well, we've added more insulation. We've decided to change to the energy code 
most of the areas and most of the states are changing to adopt different types of energy codes, whether it's the IEC 09, whether it's the 15 or like the 15 or the 18. Maryland is running, I believe, the 15 right now. So there are concerns that these homes are going to become so tight that they're not properly ventilated. So there's not enough air to live and breathe in the home. So there's not enough carbon dioxide. So if there's not enough air flowing in there and there does happen to be any type of excessive moisture in the lower level, you're naturally going to accumulate mold. So these particular products are important to pay attention to when you walk through a home and understand what's going on. Many of you do new construction inspections. You pay attention to how they wrap the windows with the Tyvek and the flaps and they wrap around if you're doing pre-construction inspections or the side flash or the seal flash. You know, these are really important. That's why they're there because these are moisture prone areas where that moisture is wicking in around that window. So pay attention to this whenever you're doing your home inspections if you're doing site inspections for new construction. Now, what is mold? Mold is simply a fungus. Mushrooms, mildew, mold, fungus, growth. Uh, prime example, how many of us see in a basement area where you have effervescence growing on the wall? And we do a lot of engineering certifications for the banks when they're now calling out in a basement area that the appraisers are going in and say there's mold down there and they call out the effervescence is mold and they want a mold test performed just to verify that it's not mold. Well, these are things that you have to be cautious of because if there's a growth there, the potential to have mold that's part of the, an integrated part of the effervescence is very possible. So surface of mold is breaking down dead materials, okay? Such as the wood and the fibers, substances used in the building materials. It's the bio in the biodegradable. Fungi and mold grow from organic matter. Everybody here, we know underst we understand what organic matter is. Carpeting, drywall, paint. Paint is something that is moisture prone to have that mold grow on it if it has excessive humidity blowing upon it. A hot dryer vent, you saw the picture of the laundry area. That's what caused that. You mix the moisture from the washing machine vapors and you put it together with the hot air from the dryer, you're gonna have mold behind your appliances. Pay attention, put your camera behind there, take the pictures, make sure you check it. Don't get caught with your pants down so you don't end up with getting a letter from somebody and saying you missed it. What is mold? Molds produce airborne spores and gases. Molds like moisture, relative humidity plus 40%. Now you went over that. Molds like temperatures between 32 and 104. Did you read that? 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Typically molds do not die above or below these temperatures. They just go dormant. I'm gonna repeat that. The molds do not die. They just go dormant. What is mold in this graph on this pyramid that we're looking at? So when you have your wet molds over on your left-hand side, you know you're dealing with 100% moisture or 100% relative humidity. So these are your dry molds going down to your lower limit growth. And it's too much of a bar graph to get into this because I don't have the time with this. But you can see by looking at the area right here where you're 60 to 70%. This is the lower level limit of your growth. And this is what's important. That's what I was saying. You know, your 50% range all the way down here that they talk about on humidity. So, you know, your mold really starts to take off at that upper 60, 70%, okay? But you also have to look at your bar graph down here to understand that that temperature can and also start down here somewhere at about 45 degrees when it hits up in here. So again, the lower temperatures can produce the mold growth. So then you have to worry about what type of a nutrient is available that's causing that to grow. So 
there's a lot of things that enter into it. What's a nutrient? A nutrient is the carpeting. You know, you might have some old wood shelving down there that's been down in Granny's basement for 50 years. So these are things that you have to look at. Take a light, shine it across. It. If you see fuzz growing off of it, like a five o'clock beer with nubbins, and you know you've got something there that's an extended growth with active mold growth. So things like this, you need to look, be cautious and very careful about this today. Who's liable? Ah, good one. Who's going to be liable? The attorney's going to call you. The inspection company's going to drop into the home inspector. Basically, the realtor's going to have to be tied into it. I mean, these are a nucleus of liable situations for mold. So this is something that I got involved with because I felt that it's very important for each and every one of you to cover your bases, to be knowledgeable on this. If you don't want to do the mold testing, at least understand that it's there and write it in the report. Cover your base. That's all I'm asking you to do. Litigation, most claims are based upon the allegation that the company real inspector should have known about the mold or, mold or possibilities of mold and did not disclose it. And that's where I'm going with all of you. Write it down. Take a picture of it. Put it in the flipping report. I don't want you ending up with an attorney from a sending you a letter that you're going to end up having egg on your face or activate an E&O policy. So just make sure you cover your bases, no matter how minor it is. If it's it just call it a fungus, a biological growth, uh, just something that takes you off base. You don't have to say it's mold because it's not mold unless it's physically tested and sampled. How do we protect our business from litigation, risk management practices? We have certified inspectors, use of qualified labs, thorough inspections. Okay, you need to identify the red flag areas, proper testing, documentation, photos, disclosure. You know, ECAN, when we put all this together, we basically have all the formats. If you ever join that organization, you get all the samples, you get all the data, you get all the contracts, you get the forms, and everything's already there. that are already created by the attorney teams to put this together. So something to think about, okay? So the other thing you're looking at is a certified mold assessor will be able to identify red flags. What's a certified mold assessor? Is that some guy that goes out there and you guys have basically attained sampling? Or is it something that you basically are in the process of learning how to write a report based upon the samples that were taken? Now, that is a mold assessor. Now, you have a couple different areas of certification that enters into this, and one of them is the sampling process that many of you probably do. Then you have another certification by EPA standards today that's certified mold assessor. Then you also have another certification that is a certified mold person that writes the scope of work and does the retesting. So you've got three different designations that EPA has come out with here in the past 18 months to understand this a little more. Uh, the inspector is supposed to make sure that he makes most of the documents and sources of the water intrusion to make recommendations if possible. And if not, just sign it off and send it over to somebody if you're not involved with doing the sampling. If you're involved with doing the sampling, sample it, take care of it, make sure your laboratory is qualified and certified. The other thing you want to make sure is don't do anything that's writing in that report that's going to place you in harm's way if you're not a certified mold assessor because you have to be able to write that scope of work and be politically correct. Identifying mold and fungi. Cannot visually identify any type of mold. It's not possible. You have to physically sample it. And you have to do it either in a viable or non-viable. You can use air samples or direct samples. What is a direct sample? Many of you have probably been around a Q-tip swab or you've been sampled it for a Q-tip swab, but if you use that Q-tip swab, did you know that you have to physically create approximately a one square inch area so that you can put it on the chain of custody for the laboratory to know that you sampled one square inch area so they can give you an exact count of the mold spore and type in that given space? You, 
if you have a tape lift, that's why a tape lift is one square inch. And then you send these off to the laboratory. And then you get your results back. When mold is visually seen, we need to know what? What the genus it is? Reference to how much it is in the breathing air? Sampling will help the assessor identify and identify what the mold can be growing on. Is there active mold or just fungi? If the problem has be has to be remediated properly. So these are things that you have to be careful of if you're going to get into this business. I just would like for you to understand it. Or if you're already in this business, attend a session where you can get the new modifications to these programs as to what these protocols are for the assessor. You should have valid reasons for sampling, visually seen mold or fungi, or moisture event, someone has allergies inside the room, other red flags, real estate transactions, unseen problems, PRV. Very important to understand, sampling is not an end of all user. Sampling is part of the process. It's only a piece of the puzzle. It's confirming your theory that mold is there, used in remediation guidance and verification. That's where the mold assessor comes in, and you have to have your qualifications for that. You have the common types that I was talking about with your tape, lift, carp, you know, your swab, tape, lift, carpet, vacuum, tape lift okay you also have bulk samples you have your spore trap or you have your petri dish different types of samples so when you're doing your testing you know you typically have your device set up in your room and you know there's a lot of people that do different things as far as testing goes over the years in the past 20 years i've been doing this i have found one process that is absolutely the way that i do it and everybody does different things and there's different protocols and the one process that I do is I turn off the conditioned air to the house, turn off the heating and the cooling. I basically, at that point, have the fan circulating for a minimum of 15 minutes. And then I take my air quality sample. And I typically take it basically somewhere close to the bedroom area because that's where they're sleeping eight hours a day. We have a crawl space or a basement area. I take it downstairs in the basement area to find out that mold that's in the basement is it making its way through the duct system and getting up into the area of the first floor. But you also have to do a sample on the outside. That's your control. It's the most important part. This is in your advanced testing for this. I would like to share this with you that came across my table last year. Uh, the EPA came out with 36 species of molds using a unique DNA signature. We can now do DNA testing for mold samples. It takes about two weeks to get the samples back. And if you have children in the house or the doctor has said there's a mold problem, you know your child is sick and somebody says, can you do a mold test? You actually can send this in and ask for a DNA sample for this and come back with a different species of mold to understand the DNA nature to pinpoint it more closely to what the child may be having problems with or adult or whoever it may be. Interpreting lab reports, important item to remember, children under six years, respiratory illness, allergies to specific molds, and it can impact 10 times more. Use activity of the room, exercise room, play area. Interpreting lab reports. This took me a long time to learn how to do this. It was not something that came about very easily. I mean, you can look at it and somebody can explain it to you. But when I turned around and started doing these reports, I actually took these reports and started putting boxes on it so I could educate people because everybody would always call up and say, you know, I don't understand this report. Can you tell us more about this report? So. These are things that you look at. So when you look at another mold report like this, and let me see if I can expand this a little bit for you. So this is a house that has on the exterior the mold sample, and we're going to pick Aspergillus penicillin. So when you're looking at your Aspergillus penicillin, I got a 480 count on the outside. But in the basement bedroom, I've got 2100 count. And on the first floor, I've got 680. So the house is literally growing mold. 
and that's how you look at these reports. You look at the control sample. So understanding this a little bit more helps you to know, but you have to also look at, you know, what about the house? What type of house are you looking at? Well, when you look at that mold report, you have to understand where is the house located? What is going on with this house in reference to water, land, mountaintop, or trees, shrubs? What is actually going on? Well, when you look at this house, you're looking at this particular house right here. When you look at that, that room that I sampled with 2100 was right here in this bottom corner. This is downwind of a major mountain, and there's the lake. And this is only 100 feet away from that lake. So you guys are smart enough to know the water coming off that mountaintop is flowing right towards this house. Now, the builder didn't do a good job in taking care of it. And this house is brand new. This is a little house that I'm involved with as an expert witness to go in and help the people with this with against the builder. But the point being is the mold was in this area here, and it's in this area over here where they have this bump out, and they put the soil close to it. So we had a lot of moisture, and that's where the mold counts are high in that basement area. So you have to pay attention to where is the house located, all the greenery, where is it at downwind or the mountaintop or upwind. These are important factors when you deal with looking at mold. So just giving you a reality check as to you guys do these kind of inspections every day. So you want to know, pay attention to the house, where it's located. Okay. Air sampling reports, uh, direct sampling, these are things that we always have that are fingertips and EPA. We will identify what molds were found in that area. EPA, no mold growth indoors. That's what they want, which is not possible, but there's always going to be mold in every house, but you have to minimize it. Levels of your inspection service. There are three levels of inspection services that are offered in mold testing. These services range from an inspection that is requested in a specific client, defined area, to an inspection that can produce mold remediation specifications. Levels of inspections, limited client defined service. The purpose of limited mold sampling is to detect presence of mold contamination in client defined areas of the home. This service provides a fast economical method of testing. The limitation of this service is that other sources of mold may be present in the home, and that's where you have to be careful. So a lot of you do mold testing and mold sampling. Some of them you might want to get involved with it. You just have to, it. It's a learning curve. It, it is a learning curve. It's not something you just jump into, and a lot of these inspectors out here, and probably some of you have already just jumped into it. You have to know the precautionary areas so you don't become in a lawsuit. Levels on the inspection, mold inspection and assessment. This level of inspection utilizes a visual inspection of the entire home, identifies red flags from mold, okay? I'll give you an analogy briefly. I'll tell you into, I was called to a daycare in the Morgantown, West Virginia area where they had babies up to three years old in this daycare and they had mold problems and one of the kids got sick so they really shut it down and the mothers contacted me and asked me if I'd come in and look at it. Well I did and I analyzed what it was and I found that what happened is they had an offset in the front of the building and it had a concrete floor in this building because it was a commercial church and what happened was they had the metal cue decking inside the two rooms in the lower level that was exposed above the ceiling. And they always had water leaking in there. And they kept saying they sealed the outside of the doors and they sealed the outside of the door. Well, where this water damage and mold damage was located is there was movement from the southwest side to the northeast side, which is where this was located. And this was up in the mezzanine area where the heat was rising and meeting the cold air above the ceiling. So you have a condensation factor that was going on, and we ended up having stachybotrys mold there, and it was quite abundant. So, I mean, it took a lot to get it cleaned up, 
and I wrote it up and we got it cleaned up. They had a company come in and they cleaned it and it still wasn't done. And what happened was the mold was so intense over the years that it basically engulfed into the 12 by 12 ceiling tails they had in this building because it was an older building and it had absorbed into this soft material. Now, once they painted and sealed it and encapsulated everything, it was fine and the mold test came back, pause it without any problems, it actually came back near zero. So that's what I'm saying. You've got to be really good at guiding this and understanding where they may be and you've got to find those red flags. Now, these are, PRV is your post remediation verification and that's basically where I went back in, did a sample and came back one time and found that it was still there and I told them I wouldn't even sample it because it still had a strong sense of the aspergillus and penicillin mold and it was foolish to do a sample. So finally we just came in and I actually rewrote the protocol and told him after that gentleman cleaned it up and he was a professional ACC certified and it still was there and he said I don't know what to do with it. So these are things that you have to learn. It's a learning curve. Contracts and agreements. Uh, ECAN, we have lots of contracts, we have our contracts and our agreements that we share with our members so that they have the correct information and they're not getting in trouble. We also have it set up for your signatures, your scope, confidentiality. Uh, typical charge for doing mold in our area, pretty much nationwide, the average is 125 per sample. We typically do three samples, okay? We don't you know, we're running in that 350, 375 range when we do three samples, but when I do that, I do also include the assessment for that as well. But a lot of guys are just doing the sampling and then saying, you know, contact somebody else to analyze their documentation. So you have to understand that a little bit to know what you're dealing with, okay? You got some hard cost and your gross profits. If you did decide to get in this or you're already involved with it, you got 30 minutes for sampling, three samples. Uh, your lab fee, typically $15 to $35 a sample, and your sampling device, $1 to $3. You know, report, you got some time in writing that, and you got a potential profit margin, okay? So, you know, generally you're making, you know, you can make $225 on a, a mold sample on a house if you're out there. So, and that's after your expenses. So, that's why it's always been a good sideline, you know, for my business as far as inspection go, okay? Now, pretty much covers a lot of it that I went into. Uh, I'd like to entertain a few questions right now. Hollis, do you want to open it up if we have any questions? All right, so if anybody has any questions, I think we do actually um, have a couple of questions. Sean, are you <laughs> how do you write it up without testing it? I'm sorry, say that again. How, how do you write it up if you don't take a test? What, what do you, would you put in your report or what do you suggest we say? That kind of thing. You're just going to make, uh, you're going to take a picture of it, you're going to put it in a report, and you're going to document that there is evidence of fungus that appears to be a biological, that is a biological growth with mold like properties. And let cool. it go. Do, do not go any further than that. Okay. Uh, biological, your base. Gro biological growth with mold like properties. Yes. So, and everybody has different terminology they use, but. Uh, I had our attorneys go through this, and they told me that was the best one to come up with. Plus, you know, ECAN, you know, we kind of stick with that as well. So just something to think about. Does that help you, Sean? Yeah, yeah. Um, another one, what do, you, what do you do for outdoor samples if it's raining? I don't do mold samples if it's raining. I never did. I, I'll cancel and reschedule. I do not do mold samples when it rains or snows. I know a lot of people do, and they'll go under the porch or something, but I don't. I don't feel that that's giving the best example of the mold that's in the external air. So straight out, I cancel. Always have. Because you, don't, get, because you, don't, because you don't get a um, a good baseline is, is the reason. That's correct. You don't get a good baseline, Hollis. You do not. And that's the, that's the one thing that's really important, as I've been showing you in these reports. The baseline is what everything you're going to sample inside that house is based upon. That control is your outside. And you have to do that sample 
and you should do it at the door that is entered the most by the people living in the home because that's the one that's letting the mold in and to the house more readily. And it should be within five feet of that door. That's another process that most people don't know about, okay? So a lot of people will take that mold sample and set it up between four and five feet in the air in a room. I put it at approximately three feet, 30 inches to three feet. And I put it somewhere close to where the return air vent is located. And I pull the air from the house. And that's why I have the air circulating. So I'm pulling air back through that filter on my device so that I can get a good volume of air in that house. Does that help you, Sean? Yes. Questions? Okay, thank you. Hollis? Looks like we got another one. What's that, what's that next one mean? Um, Biological oh, growth. Uh, he was just, like, yeah, he, he was like in that language too. You guys always like yeah. that language. So, Charlie, what um, what percentage of uh, of your home inspections do people order a mold test with? We're running at about seventy percent. Is that right? And how, so, what do you do yes. to promote it? Actually, not going? they're. The, this younger generation, this X generation of millennials in our area, they just call and ask for a price on a mold sample. And we tell them, you know, whenever they call and Rose is on the phone because she takes all the calls, she'll say, you know, why don't you wait and let us look at the house to see if you really need the samples. But, you know, this they'll just automatically say, just go ahead and schedule. We want it done. We want to know. <laughs> it, that's the mentality. And it's the younger generation. It's the it's the twenty four year olds to the thirties that they're doing it all the time. So, so you're doing tests when you don't see any evidence. You're doing it just because they asked, because they had a concern. They just asked for it. Very much so. Okay. So look what at that. What percentage of those are you getting hits on? Well, let's go here. Let's take this house here. Let's okay. talk about this one. All right. All right. This is the inside of the basement area. This is the clean house. You don't see any mold anywhere, correct? Okay. Nothing. All right. But this is where that 2100 count of mold was located. This is where it came from, right here behind this wall. So I went in and I used my four inch moisture probes that I have, and I went right over top of the baseboard into the wall stud and Basically, my moisture reading, reading behind this wall was 36%. Everybody here knows how bad that is. It's not good, 36% behind that wall. So we know that there's mold growing behind that wall. So it's going to have to come down. The other thing I do when I do a mold test is I take the relative humidity and the temperature right by the device, and I put it in the report to cover my base to know what was the relative humidity in here. Well, as you can see, we're only at 41% and 64 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're really not overwhelmed with excessive humidity, but we do have moisture there. Now, when you go to the next test in this room, here's the family room of that house. Looking over the lake, you see where my test is taken. So this test right here was reading in at 900 right here in the family room area, and they have two small boys that come down here and play video games. So they were very concerned about it because the builder told him that it had a flood and he cleaned it all up. Well, that's all relative, okay? So these are things that I look at. Now, when you look at that part, there's your sample again. Then when you go upstairs in the master bedroom, this sample was taken in the master. And then you guys remember by my mold sample, my mold, let me see where I'm at here, guys. All right, so looking back and go back to your first floor master bedroom, we don't have any spore counts on the first floor, guys. See where I'm at here at zero? So that tells you that the mold was only in the basement. It wasn't on the first floor. So these are what you're looking at to understand and get a handle on understanding these reports. So you look at your temperature, relative humidity is similar. Now, uh, you look at your outside as far as your sample goes. These are how I take my samples so that if somebody wants to verify or they call somebody else in to do 
a PRV after the test and cleanup is already done and they can't get a hold of me to do it. They know exactly where the test was taken, so they take a similar location. So that's why I do this. So just something to think about to help you with the reality check is to know about doing these mold tests. So questions, anyone? So I guess what uh, what that guy was saying was he was like he was asking what's that last word biological growth with mold like properties I think properties properties that's correct properties so I got one Charlie yes Sean you mentioned three samples included in your report in your three hundred and fifty dollars you mentioned three samples included in your three hundred and fifty dollars is that three indoor and one outdoor or no just three 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 samples total. Okay. All right, and I understand why you're asking that question because if you go back to this report here, there's four samples taken with this particular one, okay? But most of the time, there's only three samples. That's enough to give you a quantitative value of what the value of mold spore count is in a house. This particular area, the lady was very concerned about the children that she has, so she wanted the bedroom checked and she wanted the basement area checked where they have the family room downstairs. So that was what she asked for. So that's why I did it at four. Does that help you? Yes. Three samples is standard. So you typically do one try. outside, one outside, one first floor, one second floor, one basement, one, what do you mean? What, what do you usually do? I generally look for where the sleeping areas are where they're going to spend most of their time, because let's be smart about this. Most people sleep eight hours a day, so you have to have it, and you want it close to where the children are to make sure they're in safe condition. Uh, there was once upon a time I had to do a sampling for an elderly gentleman, and everyone here understands epithelial skin cells. It's where we get old and our skin starts to flake off, and you get flaking and peeling skin like old animals. So this gentleman had a new furnace installed and he was itching all the time. He was complaining because the furnace was brand new and he wanted the furnace company to come back and take it out. The furnace company called me to go in and take the sample. Well, I went in and did the sample right on top of his bed, literally, and took a couple more throughout the building and it came back that there was a 300,000 count of epithelia skin cells and his daughter was a nurse and I sent it to her and I said, the problem is not the furnace. Your father has flaking and peeling skin. And I said, it's itching and it's bothering him. You need to get his bed clothes cleaned. And okay. it was just, so, you know, the, I, I, I've run into a lot over the years and I've learned a lot. And it's, it's helped me to understand a lot of these problems. But, you know, the one thing that is pronounced whenever you're doing these inspections, Pull the return air register grill. If it's in a floor, put your camera down it and take a picture. If you're in a, the typical time to clean duct work is eight to ten years in a house. If you didn't know that, put that in your memory banks. You pull the register off on the return side, put your camera down it when nobody's looking, take a picture of it and see how bad the duct system is and how dirty it is. Just double check it because that is always the number one reason when you deal with allergenic conditions for children or anybody having problems, just check the ducts, make sure they're clean. It's very important. I got a question for you, Charlie. Have you um have you experienced any issues with mold related to like mini splits, that modern, you know, modern mini splits hanging on the wall? We don't have a lot of them in the West Virginia, Pennsylvania area. You have more of them in your area. So we really haven't, you know, and I can't say that I've experienced any issues with them other than one time, and I'll give you where it was, and this just happened one month ago, two months ago. It was a house, they had it in the second floor, it was a Cape Cod, they put it in the end unit of the second floor, and they had a unit out through the side wall, and it was facing southwest. Well, that's where our storms come from, where we live. So water entered in around the unit because they didn't have it flashed on the outside correctly. So I did a moisture check and I, I, I took a sample of where the drywall and I bagged it and I sent it to the lab and it came back. Now, I assume that majority of you understand this particular type of mold right here that I'm going to put my finger on right here, this stachybotrys, okay? That is the danger mold. 
That is the most, that's the mold you don't want to get a hold of. It's toxic by inhalation. So anytime you bump into that, it's a problem. Well, this particular mini split system had stachybotrys mold in the plaster around the unit. And when I took an air sample in the area, it was overly abundant. So they had to come in and basically remove the complete unit. They had to remove the wall cavity because it didn't seal correctly around the unit. So if I had to tell you which one to look at, if you guys have moisture probes, two inch moisture probes, look around those units and verify that they're not leaking moisture around those units. That was, the, that was actually the third one, but that was the one that was the worst. So that's what I deal with, Sean. That's where they're at. And I know that yeah. you were looking at about the air quality as to whether it has a problem or not, correct? Yeah, it's, yeah. And you're looking at understanding if there was water leaking into there, then that water is the mold that's leaking or laying on the outside of the unit, and it's leaking and leaching down inside the unit onto the fins and the coil for that heat pump unit because that's what these are. So those are contaminated. So when I turned yeah. on that unit, guess what I was breathing, Sean? Okay. Sounds lovely. <laughs> Stacky botchers. Yeah. So so that's what you I mean, all of you should pay attention to those on these mini splits because that's where it leaks mostly. Okay, that's your problem. All right. I got another one. In your experience, is it easy to sell a mold test when there's a drip humidifier installed on the HVAC? It's a trick question. <laughs> I always take the cover off the dehumidifier and look at the filter because the number one reason for mold in a house is the humidifier filter because half the people never change them. And they're typically engulfed in calcimization with black mold all around it. So it's not hard to sell that with that particular type of system, but you know, you've got to do a little bit more. And you know, most of the time when you're doing that humidity problem, you've got to watch where you're at with the duct system because if that moisture's there and that duct system's dirty, then you are adding water to the flower with that dust inside that system and that's where it's going to increase. So no, it's not a hard sale. I mean, I haven't had a hard sale with it. So you were talking about uh, doing two indoors and one outdoors. Is that regardless of the size of the home? Well, it depends. If the houses are really large and they're a football field, then I'm going to recommend that there's another sample taken in another section of the household. Okay. Um, I mean, or sometimes we have home. You, I mean, everybody here knows we sometimes have two furnaces in houses today. So you have to be careful how you're doing these testings because if you're doing one upstairs and you have an attic system and an attic furnace up there, then you have to run that system different than the one downstairs and you got to watch it don't cross contaminate so you don't enter that and you have to shut them down and do them separately. And that's why I turn the air off or on when I'm doing this. So there's, there's a methodology to doing it. It's something, it's a learning curve. You have to be smart about this. Have you encountered um, other inspectors basing their fees off of square footage? No, not not in the West Virginia area. I mean, I've done it for years, only after 3,000 feet, but, uh, you know, up to 3,000, no. I thought all the houses in West Virginia were 2,000 square feet, 150 years old, and kind of cracked the foundation wall. Is that not true? No, actually, they're actually built on uh, concrete slabs and st I'm sorry, on stone slabs that are uh, 16 inches wide, uh, 48 inches long and a foot thick. And that's what they have all these houses sitting on in West Virginia halls. OK, I stand corrected. <laughs> that's what they build them on back in the 1800s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of these days you'll get me in here to do one of these classes to teach these guys about mortar. I'll give you guys all some trivia for the day, okay? When you were dealing with understanding what is cement mortar versus what is used in mortar. Now, we're going to go back a few centuries, several centuries, to whereby what was the product that they used to make mortar 
when they were building all these buildings back years and years ago. That basically was it lime putty. It was lime, but what did they mix with it, Wellamy? Uh, uh, clay. No, what did they mix with it? There was another product. Did you know they used to use volcanic ash? I did not know that. And they mixed it, and that's what the pyramids are made out of. Plus those, in and when they mix and water, water hits the volcanic ash and the lime, it crystallizes it and it makes it harder and intensifies in in start integrity. Trivia. And mortar in our country, cement mortar in our country, really didn't hit the dock until around 1876, somewhere in that time frame. Hmm. But lime, as you said, has always been a key ingredient to the strength. That's why if you look at homes that were are built in and around the 1900s, you'll see white specks in there. And most of you that have been doing this a few years know and understand that is the lime that was the ingredient that held it together that made it strong. No different than wet plaster that they used for hundreds of years before it went to drywall. 